We're going to be talking for about 40 minutes, um, and then there'll be questions at the end. And I'm conscious that that isn't a lot of time. Um, and so I'm going to pick up on some of the housekeeping things as we go along. I'm also going to jump straight into conversation with James and Tonya and really ask them to further introduce themselves through the artworks that we have in the upcoming exhibition. So James, I'm, I'm going to turn to you first. And I wonder if you could please describe for us there's no place called home and briefly how that artwork came into being. Sure. Hi, James. Um, there's no place called home is a simple sound intervention in public space. It involves taking small audio speakers, hiding them in trees and using them to broadcast the songs of birds that would never be found in that area. For example, the calls of a Jamaican Picard from speakers concealed in, the, in a tree in the Royal Botanic Gardens in Edinburgh. The artwork is not advertised um, on site, uh, so it exists as a subtle, almost transparent atmospheric intervention in the location. It started in 2004 when I was living in Japan. It was winter. Uh, it was the first time I'd ever been in snow, which is quite something for a Cape Tonian. And it was inspired by many things, including the many forms of public address that I heard in Japan. And I decided to smuggle the sounds of a summer bird, a Cape Robin, a bird that could be considered as the sonic signifier of summer in, in Cape Town and to smuggle that into the environment there. Brilliant, thank you, James. And uh, Tony, Tony, I'm gonna address a similar question to you, but do you think you could describe for us the different elements of your new commissioned work for the exhibition, The Lure of Tomorrow's Harvests? Yeah, so the project is almost a year in the making and began with me collecting around 40 samples of honey created by honeybees and their beekeepers within the Edinburgh and Lothians area. Um, so this honey is contained within a specially constructed cabinet within the exhibition that's based on the design of a Smith's beehive. And I just want to show you an example here. So contained within a traditional hive, you will see frames that are this shape and then all of the, the hexagonal um, spaces where the queen bee will lay her eggs are contained here. But so I've kind of used that design and this um, and inserted the honey into the frames. So the, the frames and the hive was um, fabricated by a beekeeper who took part in the project, Michaela Huber, who is also a cabinet maker. So then um, I'll talk more about this later on, but um, all of the honey was analyzed for the pollen contained within it. So I've got um, etched onto the wood, you can see the different um, types of pollen that were found. So in this one, there was privet, thyme, ragwort, buddleia. So also within the exhibition, um, there are the images taken using a confocal, a very powerful confocal microscope the images of close-ups of the pollen. Um, and there's also a scent which will, which will surround the space that will all take, will they'll all be presented in the round room upstairs in the gallery. Brilliant, thank you very much, Tanya. It's, uh, it's great to sort of set a scene for everyone who's not yet had a chance to see the exhibition. So one of the roots of the phrase, the birds and the bees talk, which as we know is a, a sort of euphemistic um, introduction to sex is actually a poem by Samuel Taylor Coldridge, which is called Work Without Hope. And the opening verse of this poem reads, all nature seems at work, slugs leave their lair, the bees are stirring, birds on the wing, and winter slumbering in the open air, wears on his smiling face a dream of spring. And I the while, the sole unbusy thing, nor honey make, nor pair, nor build, nor sing. And we felt that this um, poem would offer some quite useful themes for us this evening to sort of navigate and uh, work our way through 
both James and Tanya's practices. And the first themes that we're going to look at is um, the themes of community and isolation. I think it's a real sense at the moment in contemporary culture that we are really trying to get beyond uh, some of the sentiments of these modern romantic ideas that are contained within this poem. Uh, we can see that it's problematic to think that nature is somehow this thing that's out there, that's busy, this kind of other community, and we are somehow differentiated from it, just looking on um, as if isolated individuals. However, I, I suspect that through the artworks tonight, we'll really get a sense that the reality is actually quite messy and quite complicated. Uh, and that's a reality we're now going to explore through Tonya and James's works. Um, Tonya, your um, new commission for The Normal was made very much in response to the lockdown. Um, and I noticed your first instinct to really reflect upon this quite unprecedented situation by turning towards these really interesting human bee relations. So I just wonder if you could tell us a bit more about your initial aims and motivations for the project. Yeah, so the project coincided with the beginning of the pandemic. And I find myself like many people um, spending <clears throat> more time at home observing the local environment. There is this overwhelming sense of fear across the world, but also people's focus had changed. Um, if I go hyper local and think about where I live in East Edinburgh, um, the council workers were on furlough, so they weren't um, cutting down the verges. The roundabout was all, and the graveyard was all overgrown with, um, with wildflowers and teeming with insects. The weather was also really good at that, when the lockdown, the first lockdown began. So um, for a brief moment, it felt as though the natural world was given a little bit of a chance to be more known to us, or, or maybe it's just that we were noticing it. Um, so I began, like many people, like globally, people started to think about this and it's um, scientists call it the anthropause where um, for the first time in history, um, humans kind of slowed down and we were able to observe the natural world much closer than before. So I began to wonder as well how this, because I'm really interested in honeybees in a way, how this might affect the honeybee population and um, the honey that they produce. And I wanted this project to sort of be, to, to help me just um, find something out about the local landscape and make something that reflected this extremely important year. Um, and I, and I, I felt that in all of this information could be encapsulated really beautifully within an archive of honey. I'd sort of wanted to collect an archive of honey for a while because I just want to show, share with people how amazing that honey can be. And it's not just one condiment to sweeten your food. There are so many different varieties. And it felt like this was a really important time to, to do that. Um, so I guess when I was I, I was talking to Tessa about my work in general and mentioned this idea and she was immediately really excited about the possibilities and the good thing with working with TRG meant that I was going to be able to um, connect up with other resources and other people within the university to make this project as rich as it could be. Um, so the the project at the beginning, I didn't have a very clear idea of how it would develop, but I was I wanted it to meander through the beekeeping year and to to always be open to these conversations that I was having. Um, we connected up with um, Mark Barnett and Matthew Richardson from um, Edinburgh University, who are also active members within the Edinburgh Midlothian Beekeeping Association. So that was a good starting point to reach out to beekeepers. Um, and I, get, I guess I, I used all of these conversations to try and carve an entry point into making this artwork. Brilliant, yeah, because um, I mean, the communities seem to be really central to your practice and 
I, mean, I don't know if Tanya, you'd like to say a little bit more about how you worked with the beekeeping community or the scientific community to make this project. And I guess maybe kind of let us in on why you feel communities are so central to your practice. Yeah, so um, wor yeah, working with the, the beekeeping community meant that I, I was, there, there was a lot to discover because it's such a diverse group of people um, and pe everyone had more, more time to talk to me about their beekeeping practices and about their interest in beekeeping. Um, working with the scientists who were able to analyze the, the honey sort of showed me um, the, possi the possibilities of where the project could go and it started to help me paint a picture of, of the local landscape. I guess I really enjoy working with communities um, because there's always the, the chance to find out something new and to um, sort of allow the, the groups or the people, the public, I guess, to help complete the work. Um, so I, I kind of like like working in that way. Um, especially, it was especially important working with Michaela Hoover who fabricated the beehive. Um, I, when I met her, I was just really inspired by some of her designs. She's made an amazing beehive that is also a composting toilet. And by talking to her and seeing how she worked, I realized that I really wanted this project to have something, um, something of the beekeeping craft. You know, many sort of art science projects look to the future and I hope that my project does. Um, but it was really important for me to have something really visceral and real and um, reminding reminding people of the, the bare bones of beekeeping and the craft of beekeeping. And um, I'm really interested, Tanya, in how um, the beekeeping community is kind of shaped by this other species. Um, and I mean, through, through your connections with them, I just wonder if you could tell us a bit about how bees affect or kind of make themselves known to the people who work with them. So, yeah, so when, when you first get into beekeeping, um, they tell you when you approach the beehive to not be wearing any perfume and to be very zen because they pick up on everything that you're bringing to the hive. And then as, um, as beekeepers develop, then they start to be able to um, pick up on some of this. This is what people have told me in a way. They can pick up on the smells coming from the hive and they, they know the kind of behavior to expect based on the smells, which is pretty cool. Um, I guess we also think of honeybees mostly for their reputation as busy workers pollinating billions of plants across the world and agricultural crops, gardens, allotments. But actually there are many pollinating insects, um, but it's honey bees that are most well known. And that I think one reason for that is because we have such a close relationship to them throughout history. Humans have had a really close relationship with honeybees and also because their honey is really valuable to us. I mean, honeybees are mentioned in lots of religious texts. Um, Joseph Boyce was really interested in the, the makeup of the uh, honeybee colony for, he saw it as a socialist structure and he also looked into how they produced honey. Um, lots of poets and writers throughout history. And um, there's an amazing book simply called The Bees by Laleen Paul. And she writes from the perspective of a honeybee. So she's able to write about how a honeybee uses their senses to navigate within the hive. And this, this honeybee that she writes about has got a deformed wing and is trying to hide it from the rest of the colony because if they find out, then they'll get rid of her. And um, she's, there, there's lots of, like just lots of texts and, um, poetry about honeybees that helps us, you know, connect with them. Um, Fabulous. That, that sounds brilliant. I think that's a, a book to put on the reading list for sure. 
Um, just maybe at this point, it's good for me to just cover a little bit of housekeeping because as, as Tessa mentioned, um, because of the communities that are based nature of Tanya's work, and I think because of the links through James's work, we're expecting there to be quite a lot of beekeepers or bee enthusiasts and ornithologists in the audience tonight. And just to say that we, we really welcome you getting involved in the conversation. And there's really two ways that you can go about this. You can add things to the chat, in the chat box below, the sort of speech button. And, and it, I would encourage you to see this as almost like adding footnotes to the conversation that we're having. Um, and it you know, will really enrich it, I'm sure. Uh, and then also you can add questions to the Q&A box down below as well. Um, and then there's a kind of added element to these Zoom webinars, webinars whereby you can vote on other people's questions. Um, so at the end, there'll be certain questions that float to the top that we can then put to James and, and Tanya. Uh, so please do get involved as we go along. Uh, so sticking with the theme of, of community and isolation, um, James, I, I guess in contrast to Tanya's work, there's no place called home seems to work through isolation. The Jamaican bee card that is in um, the Royal Botanic Garden, Edinburgh presently, uh, is in a sense singing quite a lonely and unrequited song. So I wondered if you could talk about how this imagined separation of a bird from its community and from its native habitat in a way gives the work its power and its position uh, to be able to speak to us. Uh, I think that we can all relate to these notions of community and isolation, uh, and they are perhaps shadows of each other, and we experience them both. Um, community on one side, and perhaps overwhelmment on the other side, and isolation on one side, and abandonment on the other side. And this image of a bird dislocated from its home, in inverted commas, and in this new place, I think, and I hope stimulates our curiosity. And the song that is unknown, the song that is defamiliarizing the landscape, a new accent in that space. And I propose that as a kind of a question mark to be answered by, by the audience. And perhaps that's also a space where I can bring community into this project, that the community is the audience that complete the work. Uh, Tony spoke about completing the work and I think audiences do do that. And so this idea of this bird that's dislocated, I, that invites all these interpretations. Birds can fly. Um, so we imagine them having freedom to go wherever they want uh, and return uh, from whence they came. And perhaps we project our own sort of feelings about what we would do if we had such skills. And with this idea of the, the isolation and, and this kind of lonely image, I think another way of reading it is the idea of an augury, which is an old traditional way of interpreting the activities of birds. Um, and that this, that this bird might be a, a, might be a message. It, uh, we might also project our own feelings of isolation or um, yeah, you know, or such like onto that bird. Great, thank you, James. And I, I think if I could just sort of push a, a sort of aspect of your responses there, because I think through through um, various strands of your practice, you're often pushing back against this idea of authorship. Um, and you know, there's a sense that with your work, you're not trying to deliver some sort of predetermined concept um, or design. And I, I just wonder if you could talk a bit more about this aspect of your practice. I think I'm, I'm looking to work with images. And when I say that the work of this Jamaican Bicard in the... Uh, Royal Botanic Gardens is an image, this, uh, that is a, an image, I suppose. Um, I'm wanting to have situations with a space, a gap, uh, a pause between the notes, something that is unlocked, I suppose like an unlocked door to allow a visitor in. I'd like the work to be like that, which would 
allow someone to, I suppose, become a co-author or a collaborator. And with that in mind, this idea of keeping the work open and flexible, it also allows the site and the climate, both the literal and metaphorical climate, to be collaborators in this piece. So all these things can affect the image and they can personalize the image. And it's, it allows for change and acknowledges that all of us will bring our own historic, historical ideas of politics and psychology and senses of humor to the work. And so that's me trying to keep these images open. Um, and this project, there's, there's no place called home, I hope stimulates all these different readings that it's not just about loneliness and the lost, although that is a, a magnetic idea and something that I think we personalize and we connect to. Um, I also like the thought of the site playing host to this wanderer. Uh, we don't know why the bird has arrived in Edinburgh um, and we are free to imagine these different scenarios, whether it's the, the lonely call or the unanswered message, or it's um, something of a refugee, a forced migration, or some kind of act of magic. That is, that's in the openness that um, I'm hoping the, the community will personalize and complete. And I'm interested as well, James, in how this, this openness of interpretation relates to ecological matters as well. It almost feels as if you're trying to leave this door open for birds or the contemplation of birds as well. And yeah, I just wonder if you could sort of draw that line for us between um, that specific artistic approach and our relationship to birds within this particular artwork. I think birds are so clever. They are a connection to the dinosaurs. They've been here for so long. Um, and I'd like to think that they're looking at us um, with the words of Puck and thinking what fools these humans be, if I can just remix Shakespeare quickly. Um, I think that the artwork, like I said, is a question. It's an unfinished melody and things are in flux. And that's something that birds teach us, or perhaps a better way of saying that is that something we could learn from birds, their powers of adaption, of um, working with situations. And with the lockdown in mind, and since my work tries to orientate around listening and within that a kind of an openness, a striving to pay attention, to pay respect, to give time, to receive, that kind of contingency and openness is again a collaborate in the work and perhaps birds are collaborating in this work. I don't know, I don't wanna speak for them, um, but it's in the space of the other that even if that other is yourself the, the next morning before you have a cup of coffee, that is also an, an, an other in the, um, in the way we think about our work and our place on earth. Wonderful, thank you, James. So I think um, this brings us really nicely onto another aspect of, of, uh, of that poem or something that's implied, I think, by the poem that we, we kicked off with, which is that maybe we um, think of ourselves as being in isolation or in community with nature um, in terms of how much we can communicate with nature and, and maybe how much it answers back perhaps even in terms of, of what counts as, as legitimate communication and what doesn't. So in this um, second section, we, we're gonna move on a little bit to think about communication and perception. Um, and I'll just really touch, quickly touch upon this, but I, I know there's a, an incredible wealth of, of books about birds that are coming out at present. Um, so there's Jennifer Ackerman's The Bird Way, which is a real celebration of all the incredible sensory perceptions that birds have, their uh, ability to, to see in light spectrums that we can't see, to smell things from hundreds of miles away, their amazing rituals and the diversity of their song. Uh, and then there's books like Richard Smith's The Indifference of Birds, which is um, 
a kind of attempt at a, an archaeology of the relationship between people and birds from a bird's perspective, which I think echoes some of the things you've said there, James, about how long birds have been around for. And I, I suppose this is my kind of shorthand way of quickly bringing in the fact that these are, um, and with bees as well, sort of amazing species that we seem to be still learning so much about and that carry um, so much mystery. Um, in, in one of the bird books, um, in David Rothenberg's Why Birds Sing, I did, however, come across a, a couple of lines that I thought would be re really useful to bring into this conversation. Um, so in this book, he says, call the sounds of bird life music and there's a place for humanity within them. Call them language and it's a foreign tongue with no hope of being understood. And I, I wonder, James, if I could ask you to sort of briefly reflect upon this. I think this is something that's implied in your work, that it's necessary for us to adopt a different kind of sensibility when it comes to approaching meaning within our engagement with other species. I think so. And I also... Another maybe a way of starting is I think there's also various forms of projection and transference going on when we approach others, both humans that we know and don't know, and also the, as David Abraham would say, the more than human world. We guess what they might be like. We anthropomorphize. We overcompensate. We frame things. Uh, we have our agendas. And. With the David Rothenberg quote in mind, I don't know if the more than human world has music. Um, as from the human perspective, I think of music as a very human way of ordering sound. Um, there might be some musicologists who are going to attack me after this. But the human ear or the brain, to be more specific, um, sorts and orders. It, um, it finds the music. Um, and music has certain functions and associations in our capitalist society. And music, like art, is an instruction to pay attention in a particular way. And there are other ways of paying attention, other things that perhaps music might be distracting us from. And I, I'd also like to speak up for the so-called foreign tongue. Uh, I find it interesting as it creates a space for listening without knowing. Uh, moments of wordless communication are still forms of communication. I've been exploring this a bit in other projects. Um, one, for example, where I literally interview objects. And perhaps I think I'd like to try and bring these ideas of music and the foreign tongue to get, incorporate them into this idea of listening without prejudice. Um, I, yeah. Perhaps I, I prowl somewhere in between David Rothenberg and the ornithologists who would like to melt down his saxophone. Um, and also, as an artist, I think by definition, I don't know. And I'm, I'm, and I'm curious, and I'm remaining curious to all of this. Thanks, uh, James. Yeah, I mean, certainly when I've, I've sort of taken the sort of Rothenberg questions about whether birds enjoy singing to bird specialists they found it quite a provocative and uh, kind of um, a question that seems to open up more questions than it than it answers presently. Um, Tonya I think you really navigate this um, difficult area by turning towards other senses um, and I know that honey tasting for example is something that you actually use as a basis for workshops with, with different people, different groups and different communities. Um, and I, because it's, it's been really important to our conversations as well, I'd, I'd really like you to talk a bit about the kinds of connections and perceptions that you think open up when you taste honey. So yeah, so I'm really passionate about smelling and tasting honey because I feel and I've noticed this when doing group honey tastings that it's almost as though if you're able to um, 
if you're able to quieten your mind and meditate a little bit and just really concentrate on what on the tasting of the honey it's as though you're being transported into another world and that might sound a bit crass but it's almost as though um it's almost as though the the honeybee can contain the maps of her foraging routes or something about the landscape within the honey and that just for like a brief fleeting moment you're able to taste that and not sometimes but not always communicate it to other people i've even done some just coming up to um, researching for this project we did some digital online honey tastings and um I find that it's even even in that method, it's really profound how people connect through a sense that they're really not comfortable talking about. We've all got not many of us are good at describing what uh, smell and taste. Um, also, we know that um, you're going to ask me next about smell, aren't you? Are we? Shall I leave it there? Maybe or? I might surprise okay. you, Tanya. Yeah. Well, I just. <laughs> So I, it's because they're so closely linked, I guess, but also we know um, very well that um, memory and smell are well connected. And when I've done these honey tastings, people talk a lot about their childhood memories or a holiday sort of thing. Um, and actually with bees, they use scent to navigate as well. And they use smell to f locate the sources of nectar in the landscape and then they're able to come back and communicate with everybody else about where they should go um, and there's also been studies done to show that they can remember these paths um, for for longer than we ever thought and they communicate using the waggle dance and other methods um, so I, I just like drawing all of the parallels and connections and I think that that really helps us um, feel more innately connected to nature. If we can use our senses a bit more, um, then that, that really helps. And we all know that, well, we know about the biophilia hypothesis that we're all innately connected to nature, but over the past centuries, we've kind of lost that a little bit. And I think that's part of the reason for that is because um, maybe the landscape has been commodified and definitely smell and taste has been commodified and um, repackaged back to us. For example, um, I was been talking to some beekeepers about um, oftentimes they will use swarm lure or different pheromones to change the behavior um, of the bees or to, to capture a swarm, for example, and they have different recipes for making these swarm lures that they often keep quite close to their chest. Um, and then I, I've been talking with Smell Library in Glasgow who are, who are trying to sort of demystify the, the smell world, the perfume world. The perfumers have closely guarded secrets about how perfume is made, but the Smell Library is trying to open that up for people. So I've been talking to them about the project and I mentioned some of the molecules that um, are in the pheromones that the honeybees use and it turns out that it's those same molecules that the perfume industry use in um, in the most common perfumes so I, I just love those parallels and I love the idea of perhaps making a perfume especially for bees and would we like the smell of it I don't, I'm not sure brilliant that, that's really a sort of fascinating territory to explore um and I suppose taking this into that kind of realm of, of language and communication, and it, it is fascinating that we have very little language to describe the kind of tastes that we might taste or the smells we might smell. I, I just wanted to ask you as well, Tanya, to reflect upon this, this kind of idea of worldless communication and maybe this, this sort of possibility of us being open and receptive to elements of nature that don't really speak the same language as, of, as us. And I wondered how much you sort of tussle with this within your practice and whether you find yourself having to push back against certain expectations or habits in order to kind of open up to these other other worlds. Um, yes. 
So I, I think being an artist, there's just so much freedom to work with those kind of issues, or those kind of ideas. And, um, and it, that's really exciting. It's, it, I like the idea of working from the perspective of, I think that's what you're talking about, looking at things from the perspective of the insects or perspective of the natural world. But then like, I sometimes think, well, how am I qualified to do that? Because I'm not a honeybee. How can I know? But I think I'm in like, I just happen to be in like a really good position at the moment to, and going back to your question earlier about community, that's, it's important to sort of work with the wider community and gather perspectives from other people to help understand better. I mean, we know that um, smell is, you know, it's, it's all about perception as smell and taste and many things. And even when you're looking at talking about contemporary art, there's so much about perception. Um, and so it's really important to always be open to so as many possible perceptions and viewpoints as possible. Great, thank you. So it, for the final section of this uh, conversation, I'm gonna sort of reframe some of the themes we've looked at as closeness and distance. Um, now, I know that um, both of your works are kind of, um, they touch upon a number of, of other political themes, things that I'm not sure will have that much uh, time to go into tonight. But of course, um, we must acknowledge that the way that we relate to nature and the way that we've been taught to nature is really intricately and deeply tied up with historical and, and contemporary political um, issues. Uh, and I, I suppose we might really see Coleridge's poem and that sense of separation within it as being symptomatic of, of those historical colonial and, and capitalist projects which have been running long before his time uh, as well. What I want to do is try and sort of focus in on, on an aspect of that, that politics and how we relate to nature is really just to comment on the fact that a lot of the really expanding market for nature writing seems to be based upon a really profound sense of loss. Uh, and I'm just gonna give an example of, of what I mean by that loss um, by quoting um, a little bit of the preface of Dancing with Bees by Bridget Strawbridge Howard, which is a, a fantastic name. Um, she writes, I was quite shocked the day I realized I knew more about the French Revolution than I did about our native trees. The thought stopped me quite literally in my tracks. Uh, I was in my early 40s at the time and remember thinking in my state of shock that I was lamentably no more aware of life outside the bubble than, sorry, outside the bubble that was my world than the inner city children I'd read about who don't know that milk comes from cows or an acorn grows out of an oak tree. And I think in other writings as well, perhaps theoretical writings, there's also a sense that not only do we have in this, the modern world this sort of profound sense of disconnect, but also that it's it's kind of played a trick on us whereby we find it very difficult to see nature in our own local habitats. I think we find it very difficult to reconcile the idea of nature with cities or with uh, technologies. Um, so there's this strange paradox of nature being very close at hand and yet somehow being rendered invisible or, or distant. Um, James, I'll, I'll maybe start with you here, but I your project really works across what is both close and distant, uh, presenting us with a bird that is endemic to Jamaica, um, and really sort of bringing us into themes that are run throughout the normal exhibition. I wondered if you could talk a bit about your choice of using um, this particular bird as a way of discussing environmental change. This particular bird, the Jamaican Picard is it's very interesting to me because it's it's not a stunning bird. It's a, a small, stout um, black bird, and it's got a really re remarkable song. And to bring it to Edinburgh was also this idea of a bird that is used to the tropical, that normally hunts in 
lowland tropical forests, moist areas. And now that it would be finding this home um, in Edinburgh is the provocation in the piece. I'm interested in that idea on that our world is changing. Uh, once upon a time, we looked and listened to the activities of birds as guides, as indicators of change, and perhaps in some ways indicators of patterns, where birds were singing, uh, might suggest that there were no large predators around, or noting that birds left during autumn and reappeared in our gardens uh, would signal spring, Persephone has arisen, and we could structure our planting schedules. And I suppose these ideas are these symbols of birds uh, that was expanded into ideas of reading fortunes, diagnosing society. And now our science with our new ways of looking, we find that birds are still in a way speaking to us. And what they're saying is, well, why should I fly all the way uh, from here, Stockholm to North Africa, for food during the winter when I can stay here. And this is perhaps the, the reverse of my intervention. It's um, that some birds are staying where they are. They're not traveling um, in the sort of imagined fantastical suggestion in my project. Last year, I, I was taking a walk and I heard a blackbird sing, not in the dead of night like Paul McCartney, but in the dead of winter in Stockholm. It was a cold, dark, snowless December. The sun downs tools at about three in the afternoon. For all intents and purposes, that bird normally, and the, the exhibition title is a, is a trick, I shouldn't be saying normally, um, normally that bird would have wintered elsewhere. Um, and here it is, singing in the darkness, um, in the cold. Uh, Perhaps it wasn't as cold as it was a few winters ago when it had traveled, but our planet is changing and birds are reacting to that. And that's, a, that's an augury and that's a warning to sort of a harbinger of something. Um, but perhaps these, these patterns uh, that are changing are, are ones that are observed by us. Birds have adapted and will adapt. Thank you, James. Um, and Tony, I mean, a, a lot of your practice, um, both in Edinburgh and previously in Belfast, has been, you know, based in these kind of urban centres. Uh, and all the honey that you've collected for the upcoming project is is from the Edinburgh district. So, I'd like to ask you how you think we can counter um, this kind of blindness and and try to become more aware of the nature that is right around us on our doorsteps. So, yeah, so like James mentioned, um, there's a like a massive shift happening just now and patterns are changing within the natural world and insects are no different. Um, and it's, you can't really miss it. You can't miss um, nature being all around us anymore um, because it's, there's quite a lot in, in the media and popular culture um, alerting us to it. Um, I think work, having worked in Belfast and Edinburgh, there's there are very different places in Edinburgh. There's a is probably is a really green city. It's a great city to live in. There's lots over time, there's been lots of consideration about green spaces, all starting off from Patrick Geddes, who was really keen on having community gardens right in the Cowgate and saw how important it was for well-being to have green space in Belfast. Um, just let's just say the city has had different priorities and um, kind of green space wasn't it wasn't really thought about, um, although there are many really amazing grassroots organizations um, who are aware of that now and making um, doing projects and changing the the look of the landscape of the city. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is I've I've experienced 
having bees in, in both places and um and what and the only thing that we can do is to is is to just change our focus and notice more and um and try and um I guess I'm not quite sure. I don't know. That's a difficult question. I think it's well answered, Tanya. And I mean, I guess one of the, the triggers really for us to think think more about this aspect of the normal exhibition was was the way that people really started to listen more to nature and to engage a lot more with nature as things locked down and things got quieter and you know the sort of city environments changed. And I think Tanya, you're actually asking the question as you went along with this project about how how did the lockdown and the pandemic impact upon beekeepers as well and that community well yeah i i should also say um so i think i guess we all know because of the pandemic we're all more aware of we need to change our actions and we're we all operate in a in a at the moment we're sort of operating in a linear economy where we um produce and make waste and then think about what to do with the waste Honeybees, for example, would never do that, and much of nature doesn't do that. They have more of a circular economy structure. So I, I guess for our own survival, we need to think more from their perspective. Um, but I think it was interesting during the pandemic that um, we all um, immediately, it felt as though we were, our saviors were the big companies were like Amazon and Tesco and Zoom were going to help us, were going to get us through this lockdown. And that was really depressing. And I, I guess that did happen. And those companies um, profit, saw their profits soar. But what I noticed in my local area was something a bit different and people were retreating to their crafts. There's people coming together to make masks and to do each other's shopping and making sure no one was left out. And also beekeepers were retreating to their craft of beekeeping. Um, and what I noticed, I also surveyed beekeepers outside of this project and I asked them questions about how much time they've been spending with their bees and so on. And um, about 40%, um, there was about 80 people surveyed and 40% said that they were spending more time with their bees and that they, were, they felt more in tune with their bees. So they were able to watch them come and go. They were learning more about what they were for foraging on. They were making decisions about what, how they might plan their beekeeping year in the future. There was one beekeeper who taught who is so if you find a, a swarm of bees in your garden or if you're worried about insects, you phone the local council and then they send you to this person who told me that they were inundated with calls throughout the lockdown of people who were just for the first time noticing insects in their garden and he was having to say it's OK, they're meant to be there. That's a, that's a really good thing. <laughs> Wow, so they were just terrified at seeing an insect because they weren't yeah, sure I guess what that was. Maybe they were usually at work and they didn't see the insects as much. I, I feel that same way about my kids. They're just sort of coming out of the woodwork at the moment. Yeah, um, well, I think that that's a really nice sort of prelude to sort of a, a question to kind of round round up the conversation before we, we see what questions have come into the chat boxes here. I, I mean, the, the poem that we've been kind of riffing off a little bit tonight is called Work Without Hope. And um, we've also talked about the future and about ogres. And so I, I suppose my my closing question to, to both of you or either of you is, you know, what, what kind of hope do you see for the future and our relationship to these other species and, and to nature? Do you, want, do you want me to answer that one first? I was, so I guess in answer to that, I would hope that I think we've there's there's kind of choices that we have to make and is it, there's choices around conserving and preserving what we have and encouraging what we have and then there's also another angle of of more intervention from us and um, you know there's there's people who are developing replacements for the coral and the coral reefs that we've destroyed but it's okay we, we can just build something new so but I, so we either go down that route or we kind of keep going with what we've already got. Um, so with my project anyway, I would hope that it would 
that people can see, I hope with the pollen images, which look quite futuristic, and then with the um, traditional looking hive, I hope that something of that um, is, people consider something of that and wonder, are we going to go in the futuristic direct direction or we accept all the knowledge that we have and build on it, if you know what I mean? And maybe think about what a honey archive in a hundred years would look like. Will it just be one jar of honey, one type of honey, because there's only one thing to forage on? Or will it be a synthetic honey that we've made up ourselves? Yeah, and I'm, I'm thinking of the science fiction book, uh, A History of Bees and the sort of future in which people have to pollinate the trees because there's no longer any insects left to do that That's job. That's already happening in some parts of the world. They're already doing that. Mm. Yeah, it's a scary reality. And, and James, would, would you like to respond to that as well? What just came to mind was the um, science fiction book, The Three-Body Problem, which poses the idea of a, a hostile alien force that are in, about to invade Earth, but they are 400 years away. So how does the Earth, with the knowledge that they are going to be decimated by a higher intelligence, how does the Earth respond to this? What do you do with that? Um, it's a metaphor, I suppose, for our climate crisis. The things I'm hoping for, compassion um, to each other and to the more than human, um, that we start practicing, that we are part of the web of nature, that we live in the earth and not on the earth, um, that we're not visitors and we shouldn't, that we don't act like tourists. Perhaps also in a kind of a philosophical way that we can sit with and get better at or grow accustomed to being with the unknown, 